Word up, followers! As you can tell, I've got the same shirt on, which means I'm still here in my office making lectures. Let's do it. Day 25, MO Theory. Here we go. All right. So I'm back to using my dry erase marker, but it's fatter. Uh, so we'll see. You can leave in the comments which marker you like better. I can't even read what that says. Molecular orbital theory. All right. So I'm even... Get rid of that marker. That marker is terrible. Okay. We're going to use this marker. H2 plus. We can do it. But beyond this, we can't do anything else. No, I'm just kidding. So... Let's write down the Hamiltonian for H2+. Plus. Okay, so we know that it's negative h-bar squared over 2me times del squared plus our potential energy operator, right? Kinetic and potential. And so if we write our potential energy <coughs> for uh, the situation we have, excuse me, which is the following. Here, if I have atom A, <clears throat> and if I have atom B, and there's some distance between them, that's our uh, bond distance that I'll note with the capital R, and with this H2+, plus, um, so we have two nuclei, and they're just going to share one single electron that I'll note right there. Okay, and so there's going to be some radius, uh, I'll call that RA1, from nucleus um, A to the electron, and that's going to be at some angle theta. And then we also note that there is going to be some radius to uh, nucleus B. Okay, so they're both sharing the same electron. And so with this in mind, my potential energy of this picture becomes the following. So I'm going to have my Coulomb's law dependence, right? Uh, negative e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught. Um, and I'm going to call this for later on in the lecture, I'm going to call this constant J0, this whole constant here. So that's going to appear later on. And then this is going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't have corona, I swear. Maybe I'll drink a Corona later, but I've just been talking too much, so I have to cough. So uh, we know that in Coulomb's Law, it's a 1 over R dependence. So it's all this junk times 1 over RA1, and it's going to be plus 1 over RB1, and then it's going to be minus 1 over R. So these two terms give me an attractive interaction. So it's the interaction of the radii on the electron. But this term here, R, right, that's the, the um, Coulomb's dependence between the two nuclei. This gives me a repulsive interaction. Um, and as it turns out, this system can be solved. So if we were to go and plug the uh, potential energy operator to our Hamiltonian, right, and do h psi equals e psi, uh, we can actually solve this problem. But beyond this, um, not so much. Okay, so we're going to rely on the method that's called L, uh, I already got one letter wrong, L C A O M O. So that's the linear combination of atomic orbitals to form molecular orbitals. Okay, so. I'm going to first start defining this as psi plus minus. So you're going to see we're going to have this plus minus state. And I'm going to write this with simple notation for now. Okay, so n, uh, we shall recognize that's going to be my normalization constant. And a is going to be my wave function of a. And b is going to be my wave function of b. And there's a plus minus. Um, because we can't know which is which with arbitrary precision, and we also recognize when we change the labels, the wave function has to change sign, according to Pauli. 
So that's why we're going to have this as a plus minus b, where I'm going to call a, uh, we adopted the nomenclature last time, chi h 1s a, and b is chi h 1s b, where then, of course, a, um, so this is actually our 1s electron, which hopefully you remember, that's 1 over f uh, root pi Bohr radius cubed times E, and I'm going to use my nomenclature here, RA1 divided by little a, the Bohr radius, so that's this radius right here, and of course similarly B is going to be 1 over pi A cubed E to the negative R uh, B1 over the Bohr radius A, all right? And so that's referring to now this interaction right here. And uh, so we're going to have to draft up some kind of an equation to describe either RA1 or RB1. And I'm going to write that in terms of uh, B. So we'll say RB1. Um, and as you notice here, we can do this geometrically. Okay, so that's going to be um, R. A1 squared plus R squared, and then because of the um, theta there, we're going to note that there's a cosine dependence, right? Uh, COA, SOCOTOA, right? Remember that acronym? 2RA1, and that's going to be times big R times cosine of theta, and all of this is going to be the square root. Okay, so that's RA1 squared plus big R2 squared minus RA1 times R cosine theta. All right, so now if we keep going with this, if now I want to look at uh, the square modulus, for example, and let's pick the plus state for now, psi plus, so then I'm simply just going to FOIL this equation. So now that becomes N squared, and then I'm going to have uh, a squared plus b squared, right? So first, outside, inside, last, and so that's going to become a plus a 2ab. And so what does all of this give us? Well, a squared gives us the um, probability of that the electron is on a, and b squared gives me the probability that electron is on b. And now this a b term, okay, is what we call the overlap integral. The overlap integral or the overlap density. Um, and it describes the enhancement of electron density in the internuclear region. So again, A squared is the probability that the electron is just centered on A. B squared is the probability that the electron is just centered on B. And I know you can't see this, but that says, uh, let's see if I can get it. There we go. 2AB, um, that is uh, our, what we're going to call our overlap integral. So the electron density between the two nuclei. Okay, so a few conceptual uh, points that I'm just going to describe. Um, bonds form when electrons accumulate in regions where atomic orbitals overlap and interfere constructively. Electrons can interact with both nuclei, which lowers the overall energy of the molecule. And uh, just like we came up with this sigma bond in valence bond theory, our sigma bond still has the same significance it's what we call our bonding orbital. And specifically, we're going to refer to the psi plus state as our 1 sigma 1. So I'm going to get into our MO notation here momentarily. Um, but we're going to see special significance of psi plus compared to psi minus. OK, so moving along. So let's see here. So for now, we're calling this uh, 1 sigma. And if I solve this wave function by 
uh, right, using uh, the Hamiltonian operated on this wave function, that I get my, uh, I'm going to write this up here in this corner, E1 sigma. And E1 sigma, and sometimes we also call this E plus, okay? This, uh, the solution of this ends up being E H 1s, which is actually the energy solution of the hydrogen 1s electron, plus J0 divided by R, so that's that same constant that we got here, minus uh, J plus K divided by 1 plus S. I'm going to define what all of these things are uh, momentarily. All right. So um, this, right, is the energy of a hydrogen 1s atomic orbital, all right? Um, this, if you recall, this term, right, when you look at this potential energy term, if I distribute this through, that was our repulsive term right there. So this is the potential energy of repulsion between two nuclei, repulsion between... A and B. Um, and we'll talk about what all this stuff is here uh, momentarily. But now, continuing along, so my big capital S is actually the overlap integral. Okay? And so that goes as uh, A, B, D tau. Don't forget about D tau, right? R squared, sine theta, uh, dr, d phi, d theta, uh, right? I think I said all that correctly. Um, so that's our overlap integral, all right, um, which is this term right here. Uh, little j, not j sub zero, right? j sub zero is all these constants. This j right here is equal to the following. j zero times the integral of a squared over rb1 d tau. And that represents the interaction between a nucleus or, excuse me, that is the interaction between a nucleus over here, or excuse me, uh, A squared on RB1. So this is the interaction between the nucleus A and the electron density when it's centered on B. All right? And then similarly, this uh, K that's right here, this equals also J0 times AB over R B1 d tau. And this represents the interaction between uh, the nuclei and the excess electron density in the inner nuclear region from overlap. All right? So we have a combination of describing uh, repulsive interactions between the two nuclei, attractive interactions between either the nucleus A on the electron or the nucleus B on the electron, or the nucleus A on the electron interacting with B, or the interaction of B uh, on A and the electron. Okay, so it's a rather complicated solution of energy, um, but all the same, it can be solved. It has an analytical solution. Um, so that's good. So we can actually solve all this, right? I've defined A, I've defined B, uh, right? We could easily integrate that with respect to d tau, we could easily do little j, we could easily do little k, and we could actually put those equations together and uh, get something realistic out of it. All right, so now I'm going to go and do uh, clear the board here and keep moving on. I have to decide what I want to keep. All right, so I think I'll keep um, all of... I'll keep the solution for A. Oh, yeah, oops, I used uh, the wet erase because I was not satisfied with how well it does. So we'll use the eraser, and then I'll use my paper towel right here. Okay. A little bit more. OK, 
Okay, great. So I'm going to leave this solution up, and I'll remind you, uh, let's see, let's just write, let's remind ourselves that this was from E1 sigma, and that resulted from psi plus squared, right, which was uh, n squared, uh, a squared, plus b squared, plus 2ab. Uh, 2ba, 2ab, same thing. Okay. So now, if I look at the psi minus state, and we'll look at the square modulus of psi minus, it's going to go n squared, normalization constant, times a squared, plus b squared, and then minus, uh, I'll write this as 2ba just to be consistent. Uh, so there becomes a negative sign there for that overlap density. And then, um, so this gives me this solution, and then this gives me the solution that I'm going to note as E2 sigma, and sometimes that's referred to as E minus, all right? And so this equals E H1s, so that's still the same solution here, the H hydrogen 1s atomic orbital. And then we're still going to have plus J0 divided by R, right, the repulsive interaction between J and B. But now in our combination of um, overlap integrals, there's a sign change. So we have J minus K over 1 minus S, and where those J, K, and S's are the same that we defined previously. And so now if we look at these results, we note that there is... Um, Big letter R, big R dependence on these things. And we're going to start getting um, what I think should be uh, a familiar looking plot. So here we have E energy plus minus. I'm going to plot both of those on the Y. And then now I'm going to plot a big R on the X axis. And I'll remind you of our picture, right? We have um, atom A and atom B separated by distance r, and they're sharing um, an electron between the two of them. Okay, that was our picture, right? Our H2 plus picture. Okay, so now if we look at the E plus state, or the E1 sigma, um, you actually get a very familiar looking picture, and it looks something like this. which is pretty cool. So this is what we call our uh, Leonard-Jones potential well. Okay, our LGA potential well, Leonard-Jones, um, which is our E plus state, our bonding state. And so what we have way out here at large R, we would have two separate hydrogen atoms and what we would get down here at the bottom of the well would be our H2 plus. And of course, this uh, energy down at this scale, that would be my bonding energy. Okay. All right. And then, of course, here at uh, the X position, that would be my most favorable uh, distance between the two bonds. So the equilibrium bond distance. So that's um, E plus, and that's what we call our bonding orbital or our bonding state, uh, one sigma. So now if we were to plot the E2 sigma or the E minus, uh, we would actually see a completely different dependence. Um, so I'm going to draw arrows showing you which way the curve goes. So uh, this would look something like this. It'd be way up here. And that's what we call a repulsive state. So that's my E minus, okay? And that creates my repulsive state, which I also call an anti-bonding orbital or an anti-bonding state. And so if we think about the two differences between these, um, if I'm on this uh, bonding energy curve, right, I want to lower my potential energy. So this is going to be like my sweet spot right here. Okay. But if I'm in this anti-bonding orbital, there's no minima. So the 
molecule will want to continue to minimize its energy, and it will continue to minimize its energy until it exists as just two separate nuclei. So that's why we call it an anti-bonding state. All right? And generally, the um, anti-bonding state always lies higher in energy than the bonding state. All right? Okay, so let's see here. If I keep going on, I've got a little bit more uh, room to draw this stuff up. And so we kind of looked at this last time, right, with valence bond theory. So there's some uh, competing or some overlapping ideas, uh, right, where we noted, um, let me pick a different color, where we have our individual atomic orbitals, right? That was the uh, exponential decay of my wave functions. And we note when those combine, right, there's overlap between the two right there. So that overlap uh, density, right, gives me my, um, that's literally my overlap integral right there. All right. And so that leads to shared um, electron density in the internuclear region. But now if I look at my, um, so this is bonding. But now if I look at my anti-bonding state, Okay, I'm going to end up with a one wave function that looks like this. But I'm going to have my other wave function changes sign. So it's going to look something like this. Um, so when you add those together, there's no enhanced density in the internuclear region. So you have no um, electron density there. Okay. So once again, let's go ahead and uh, switch it up here. Try to erase this the best that I can. Okay. Okay, once again, I look like a kid that's been playing with markers all day long. At least that's what my kid looks like after he's been playing with markers all day long. All right, so now let's keep going with this. So uh, let's see here. So we're going to now get into talking about um, more on these uh, bonding orbitals and antibonding orbitals. Um, but the first thing that we want to discuss here is using a, a more organized set of nomenclature um, as well as thinking about the symmetry. Okay, So I'm going to go back to these pictures again. I'm going to redraw them here um, just so I can have some more room. So I'm going to go back again uh, to my uh, bonding state right? that looks something like this. Okay, and then these add together to give me enhanced electron density. And um, if I now, I'm going to flip this 90 degrees and let's say, you know, look at it um, down, uh, excuse me, let, rather, let's look at it down um, another way. If I looked at it in polar spherical coordinates, right, I've got cylindrical symmetry here and cylindrical symmetry here. So this region right here, this gives me my overlap. So that's my overlap integral right there, okay? And so that actually refers to, right, A, B, D tau, okay? And so now, if you look at this, right, both of these are into the positive signs, right? So this line, right, is positive values on this side of the line and negative values on this side of the line. So when I look at the symmetry of this, so um, it's positive, on this side and positive on this side. And when I draw a line through some center of inversion, okay, um, then because it doesn't change, we call that Girard, which is the German for even symmetry. And we're going to call this the one sigma G. So the one sigma G represents the bonding state uh, of 1s 
and we use the G for Gerard. Okay. So now if I go and look at my, uh, and then uh, let's see here. Yes, that's pretty good. So now if I look at my antibonding state, once again, okay, so I had like, you know, positive values on this side, but then I had negative values on this side. All right, and if I make that like, you know, the shape of my orbitals, if I were looking at this in polar spherical, okay, I've got a circle there and I've got a circle there, but now this area right here is my anti-overlap integral. Uh, so that's S equals negative A, B, D tau. So that's my anti-overlap. And now um, if this one is positive and this one is negative, when I draw my center of inversion, it changes signs. So we call that un uh, which is asymmetry. And now we're going to call this the one sigma u antibonding state. All right. So a few things to consider. Um, electrons supplied by atoms are accumulated in orbitals to achieve the lowest overall energy configuration subject to constraints by Pauli. Uh, if several degenerate orbitals exist, electrons are added singly to each individually orbital before w doubly occupying any one orbital. So that's um, all stuff you know from Gen Chem. And, excuse me, if two electrons occupy different degenerate orbitals, then a lower energy is obtained if their spins are parallel. So that's saying triplet states are lower in energy than singlet states. Okay, so sigma orbitals. So these are linear combinations of 2s and 2pz, um, and of course 1s and 1s, and h2 only. Um, we could also do linear combinations of 2s and 2s, but right, it's all about having symmetrical, uh, sym cylindrical symmetry about the z-axis. So if I start trying to make up here the h2 molecule, Right? I know that I have an H1s uh, electron right here, and I have another H1s electron here, and they will combine to lower their energy to make a 1 sigma g orbital, okay? Or they would combine to make a 1 sigma u orbital. Now, in the previous nomenclature, um, we called this uh, one sigma, and then we called this two sigma, so I know that gets a little confusing, but here we're going to use the G and U notation to tell us specifically, um, in the one sigma orbital, one sigma G is bonding, one sigma U is anti-bonding, okay? And so now, because I have one electron each, I combine these, and each one comes down and gets paired up, and I form a bond. So, and this is, uh, if you recall from your Gen Chem days, right, this is a molecular orbital diagram. And so now, of course, we can use this to describe why something like helium-2 can't exist, uh, right, because each helium brings two electrons to the party, right, each one is 1s2. And now I have four electrons I have to distribute through this. So that would go one, two, three, four, and I would have two electrons in a bonding orbital, two electrons in an anti-bonding orbital, and that's why helium uh, can't exist, okay? So now um, I can make combinations, right, by combining 1s and 1s. Uh, we talked about, uh, which we did, we could combine 2s and 2s if we like, um, and we could also combine 2s and 2pz. So let's continue with those combinations. So if I combine 2s and 2s, I'm going to get a basis set that looks something like the following. Normalization constant times a 2s wave function plus some other normalization constant, b 2s. And so uh, as it were, 
as it turns out, we actually need both sets here. Okay, sorry that you can't see because of the glare. Let's see if I can minimize that, all right? So I actually need another set that I have to combine this with. And that other set is going to be the combination of a 2PZ plus B 2PZ, all right? And so what we get from this entire basis set, if we had the A 2S plus minus with the B 2S, and plus minus gives us bonding or anti-bonding, right? That's going to create um, the, we still call it the one sigma G and the one sigma U, all right? So one S and one S is really like our exception because H2 is the only thing that can do it, all right? And so that gives me this one set. But now with this set right here, right, I'm going to have the A 2PZ wave function and plus minus the B 2PZ wave function. And then what I get from this set right here is the two sigma G and the two sigma U. So we've already looked at one sigma G and one sigma U, and I would get the same thing from 2S, the same thing from 2S and 1S, but just different sizes. Um, but now, what does the two sigma G and one sigma G look like? All right. Um, so it would look like the following, okay? So I have, uh, so here I'm doing right 2PZ and 2PZ, okay? So when I add those together, I'm going to get something that looks like this. I'm going to have some combined density between the two, cylindrical symmetry, with some region out here. So as it turns out, this goes negative, positive, positive, and then negative. This creates the two sigma G, and we know that it's G because if I cross this center of inversion, right, the signs don't change. But now the two sigma U looks uh, something like this. So here's my two nuclei, and I get a region of negative, and then I get a region of positive, and then I get a region of negative, and I get a region of positive. So there's uh, a node between the two density. So that's what makes it, uh, so it's, again, that's two sigma u. That's what makes this an anti-bond. And we get the u symmetry because, once again, if I draw the center of inversion line, it changes signs, okay? And so um, now, just very briefly, I'm going to go to the pi bonds, um, and then I'm going to switch over and talk about our uh, mathematic assignment. I'm going to grab some more paper towels here to clean off my board. Okay. And when you see this one on Mathematica, right, this is part two of your uh, Mathematica 8 assignment I'm referring to. I think this one is really, really cool. I really enjoy this simulation that you all are going to get to see here in a moment. All right? Okay. So, nice and clean board. There we go. All right. So, if we now look at pi bonds, all right, these are linear combinations of 2px and 2py specifically. And we're going to end up creating uh, what's called the pi x bond and the pi y bond. All right, so let's look at our axis again, our z axis. And if I look at um, what's going to make uh, the pi g state and the pi u state, we're actually going to see something different than what we saw with sigma orbitals. So here if I draw these orbitals, okay. Um, so we know with pi g, the sign can't change when I cross the center line. So as it turns out, what that means is here, this becomes my region 
that's positive, and this becomes my region that's negative, and this becomes my region that's negative, and this becomes my region that's positive. And that's what allows me to flip or to really have the G uh, Girard symmetry. Okay? And so um, this is uh, from a combination, right, of, uh, excuse me, so our pi x, right, could be pi x g or pi x u. Uh, sorry, I didn't expand on that earlier. Pi y g or pi y u. All right. And so um, what this means now is pi g is technically anti-bonding. All right. And so pi u, on the other hand, where now these are both oriented in the same way, right? It's got this undurad symmetry because it's changing sign when I cross that plane. So now that means pi u is my bonding orbital. All right. And so now what happens as I push this pi u state together, as I get these closer and closer, uh, we end up getting kind of something that looks like this, and it's going to look so much better on your Mathematica file, right? And this is what creates your double bond, right? So if this was my internuclear axis, there's no cylindrical symmetry on the z-axis, right? The electron density is now centered um, above or below that axis. So that's what actually creates uh, the double bond. Okay. So now I'm going to switch over, um, I'm going to switch back to the screen for a second, um, or switch screens in, in just a minute, but I'm going to walk you through how you're going to do molecular orbital theory um, in Mathematic Part 8, and we're also going to do our Cartesian coordinate scheme. So let's redraw the picture that we came up with, okay, so MO theory in Cartesian and so now if I have um, let's say A and then here's B and we're gonna put the electrons somewhere right there and we said this was R A 1 and we said this was R B 1 and so now I'm gonna define in my coordinate scheme that this line is my y-axis, and this line right here is my x-axis. So I'll put a little key over here, um, positive y and positive x. And so that means uh, this way is negative x, and this way is negative y. So right here, this point, I'm going to call that my origin. So I'm going to call this 0, comma 0 in my Cartesian coordinate scheme. And so now, and also what we're going to do, um, we're going to do this in flat world. So even though um, we just talked about specifically that 2px and 2py make up our um, pi bonds, and 2pz, right, when they're oriented this way, that makes up a sigma bond. In this model, we're not going to have a 2pz. Our 2pz is actually going to become 2px. When you think about it, right, so if my x dimension is this way, then I'm going to make um, sigma bonds by orienting them in this orientation to each other. So this is just for a Mathematica model. We're technically going to call it 2px a 2pz. And you'll see why in a moment. Okay. And so now, if I go and look at the geometry of this, right, I can relate the radii to their distances on x and y, um, which should be x squared plus y squared square root, right? Um, but what I'm going to do now here is define this total distance as r, okay? And so that means everything that goes this way um, should be the following, um, should be, uh, these are all x values. And these will be x plus r over 2 going this way because from here to here is half of my r. And from here to here is the other half of my r. So everything that goes this way should be x minus r over 2. 
all right? And so this now allows me to specify one uh, internuclear distance, and then x and y will be, or just really x will just be dependent on that. And so now if I'm doing the geometry on this, okay, I can say that RA1 equals, um, so RA1 is going to be this length and this length, uh, but use Pythagoras, right, because we've made a right angle out of those. And so this distance right here is x minus r over 2. So that's going to be x minus r over 2, all squared, plus y squared, square root. So that says uh, ra1. And then now rb, this distance, right, is going to be this x plus r over 2 squared plus y squared all square root. So that's r b1 equals x plus r over 2 squared plus y squared square root. All right? And so what you're going to be able to do with this in Mathematica is now we're going to take orbitals like this. So these will be our, um, so in this model, okay, our py orbitals will look like this. And we'll be able to move them um, in and out of each other. And our px orbitals will look like this. And we'll be able to move them in and out of each other. And so my py will create um, pi bonds. My px will create uh, sigma bonds. So now let's take a look at that. I'm going to switch over to uh, my Mathematica desktop here. OK, so here's your part two MO theory. And this time, um, we're going to actually use Bohr radius. And here I've got this defined. Uh, so it's 52.9 angstrom. So this is defined uh, in terms of nanometers. So 0.529. All right. Uh, oh, excuse me. So it's 52.9 uh, picometers. So this is in uh, angstroms, rather. 0.529 angstrom. And so um, this is the normalization constant between uh, the two AB states. And uh, I'm just kind of giving you like a reasonable value, 0.56, you can use that. And so here I'm defining RA1 as a function of x, y, and r, right, just like we did. And RB1 is a function of x, y, and r, just like I drew in the picture. So recall that um, A1s, right, this is that 1 over pi, Bohr radius cubed, square root, exponential to the negative radius. This time my radius is a function of x, y, and r. Um, and then here I'm defining my b function. And then recall we said the 1 sigma g orbital, and here makes z equals 1, the charge. Um, so we're talking about hydrogen. The 1 sigma g orbital, psi 1 sigma g, right, is a plus b. And I want you to to plot, so on a contour plot, psi squared, and we're going to manipulate it. And what we're manipulating is our distance between the two nuclei. So here's what this looks like. So here in my manipulate, I've said r from 2.5 to 0. So I'm starting these two nuclei um, 2.5 angstroms away from each other. And if you look at my scale, right, here's my origin, my zero line. And so that means that it's a 1.25 angstrom this way and 1.25 angstrom this way. And this is really cool. As I get these closer and closer together, right, they haven't uh, interacted with each other yet. But now look, their electron density is starting to get sucked into the other nuclei. And this is really cool. Look, I have overlapping density. And now if I go to about one angstrom, um, which is about the bond distance of H2, look at that. There's my sigma bond, which is really, really cool. So now if I go and look at my one sigma U state, my anti-bonding state, which is given as A minus B, like we just talked about, okay, now if I go to about one angstrom apart from each other, look, they're repelling each other. They never quite get that enhanced electron density. Um, so, right, that's 0.56 angstrom. If I make this 0.56 angstrom up here or something like that, um, right, they're just sharing uh, density 
in that internuclear axis. But here, if I get these close enough, they just annihilate each other. Poof, they're gone. So that's why we call it the anti-bond. So now if I, I'll just show you a couple examples from the pi state. Um, so here is 1 pi u, which remember now with the pi state, the symmetry is the opposite. So the 1 pi u state should make a bonding orbital. So now as I move these two p orbitals closer and closer to each other, uh, this gets really cool here. So if I make them about, you know, one angstrom apart or so, there are my uh, pi bonds right there. So let's go about, you know, 0.8 or so angstrom. There we go. So, uh, and again, this node that you see right here, right, that would be my internuclear axis where the sigma bond is created. So this is an off axis bond that we know as the double bond. And of course, if I look at my one pi g, then that's my anti-bonding state, right? And if I get those really close to each other, 0.7 angstrom, they never quite want to bond, right? There, um, there's no electron shared electron density between them. And then if I go and look at my now my two sigma g which is going to make my sigma bond. So now this is, you know, technically these are supposed to be 2p z orbitals, but because we're doing this um, in like a flat world representation, they're technically 2p x, right? doesn't matter though, they're oriented to each other and that creates um, what we call the 2p z or the 2 sigma g rather, right? So now this is 2 sigma, even though I'm using, you know, p's, right? So now as I get these closer to each other, uh, they're gonna make that lovely sigma bond right there um, that I drew a picture of, but not so well. So right here is my cylindrical symmetry about the Z axis. And what's really cool about this, these um, empty spaces right here actually create the vacancies um, for a lone pair. So that's where a lone pair uh, would exist if we had enough electrons, which is really cool. And now my two sigma u, this makes my anti-bonding state. And if I get those really close to each other, right, they never quite want to form that uh, symmetry. So they just eventually annihilate each other when you get them uh, on top of each other. Okay, great. Kind of. They've almost annihilated each other. All right, folks, so that should be enough to walk you through your second part for your MO theory. Um, so hopefully you learned some really cool stuff from the Gen Chem days and see how the our uh, quantum mechanics manifests into valence bond theory, molecular orbital theory. I know we didn't spend a lot of time on this, just one lecture each. Um, so I'd encourage you to read more. Um, we're still gonna talk a little bit more about molecular orbital theory, um, but this will be uh, about as much quantum mechanics as we apply to each of these two theories. All right, folks, I'll see you later.